Welcome back to the lab. Welcome back to EE for everyone. LEDs that look like they're flashing. I think that just might be one of the most distracting and annoying things in the entire world. As humans, we're kind of programmed to look at stuff that moves or flashes, like a flashing light. For example, this might just be the most distracting thing in the world. Can you even see me in front of this garbage? Well, let's fix it. Today I have the pleasure of kicking off a new project, and this one is going to be something very special. It seems like I often run into the same problem, uh, something that seems to reoccur as I continue to age like a fine wine. You see, before I started going gray, I could think of a thousand different projects to do at any particular time. There seemed to be an endless list of problems I could solve in the world around me. I'm not sure exactly why, but that just seems to be less true these days. Maybe I'm old, but I've found that I'm generally more likely to buy a solution to a problem than build one. Now, while I've come to be something of an expert in the field of making up fake problems to solve, thankfully one of my good friends had a pretty common problem, and one that sounded like a lot of fun to solve. You see, this guy does a lot. He's into the world of AV equipment, sound, lights, cameras, all that good stuff, and he had a problem. A real problem. Basically, he was controlling some LED tape using DMX, pointing a camera at it, and the problem? Well, whenever a particular color was set to less than full brightness, so red, green, or blue, one of the primary additive colors, it made the strip look like it was flickering or flashing on camera. Some colors were better than others, but he just couldn't trust his lights to appear constantly lit the same way to a camera as it does to the human eye. I'm sure that you've seen this before in one form or another, either from a cheap LED fixture that has 50 or 60 hertz flicker baked in. For me, it's these cheap floodlights behind me, but the flickering effect is pretty much the worst thing for capturing video content. It's so distracting to see the background of a video flicker, so Maybe some of you have noticed that we always tend to use red, green, blue, yellow, teal, and purple as accent colors. It's the additive color wheel. In short, the flickering problem is actually a visual manifestation of aliasing. In this case, aliasing due to a difference in the refresh rate of an LED with the sample rate of a camera. At first, Alex was using a controller much like this which is good because it sets the bar low enough that we can certainly do better. You might notice the distinct lack of a refresh rate specification on the sales page with a no-name microcontroller, so cool. We basically know nothing about how it works, but the specs probably don't exist because they aren't very impressive. Thankfully, these controllers are cheap, only about 15 bucks delivered, and they look good enough to the human eye thanks to persistence of vision that kind of fills in the gaps when the LEDs are off. Thankfully for my friend, there are plenty of LED drivers that can refresh at a higher frequency of around 500 hertz for a slightly higher price. Unfortunately, the price starts to go up pretty fast for anything faster than 500 hertz, with options for 2 kilohertz or even faster PWM dimming available off the shelf. Now, we have to think about this a little more, but 2 kilohertz is probably overkill, considering we have a 60 hertz camera system, but we should ensure that there are at least two LED on pulses during each camera sampling interval if we really want to get rid of this flicker. And that sampling interval can be a lot shorter than the frame rate. Uh, the sensor isn't active the entire time. But I feel like I just skipped a step, so let's circle back to aliasing. Also, a warning to any of you who struggle with epilepsy, there will be a lot of flashing at different frequencies for a few minutes, so just please look away and just listen along until you hear this tone. Again, aliasing is one of those fundamental concepts that relies on an understanding of frequency. I don't know what it is about frequency, but it just seems to blow people's minds sometimes. So I've put together a quick explainer animation that should hopefully get the point across. First, let's consider this blue flashing rectangle. Wait, uh, <laughs> let's slow that down. This shape represents the refresh rate of the LED strip or light source. It's blinking regularly, and to our eyes, it looks pretty consistent. I mean, the on and off time is pretty consistent. Now let's speed this up, and as it speeds up, that flashing will slowly transition from a blue flash on a gray-black background to a blended blue-gray color, and eventually it'll just look blue. And this is because of how our eyes work, and 
I'm sure the video compression algorithms didn't help and probably blurred things together too. The awful thing that Alex is now keenly aware of is a simple fact. How our eyes process and interpret light doesn't matter when you're dealing with a camera. This is actually pretty similar to the fundamental difference between analog and digital systems. Digital video cameras introduce something like quantization error, both in color and in time. A camera's shutter means that there's a time where light is being processed by the camera sensor, and then a different time where that light is ignored. Time passes while the shutter is closed without being captured. So for every frame of video that gets captured, there's some amount of time spent processing light and some time gets missed. Our eyeballs are essentially analog cameras that have a functional bandwidth rather than having a refresh rate and they truly are incredible pieces of technology. To build a camera that rivals the human eye is very difficult. The analog processing that happens in our brain through our eyes means that high frequency content, so flashing lights or stuff that moves by really quickly, it'll start to blur together when seen by the human eye, rather than getting completely missed by a digital camera if the shutter's not open. That's only half of the problem though, so let's dig a little deeper. I've added a gray shutter over half of the blue rectangle to demonstrate the possible effects of a camera shutter and to allow you to see side by side the analog and digital representation. Hopefully, this will allow you to see the effect that I've been describing. I've just downgraded your fancy analog eye into a digital one for half of the frame. In this example, the simulated refresh rate of the camera shutter is similar, but slightly slower than the LED. Can you pick out how some of the blue flashes are partially captured, completely captured, or even completely missed by the camera? Um, let me slow that down a little more to make it more obvious. This is where that weird flashing effect in video comes from, that many might call flicker. Sometimes the camera will capture the full brightness of the LEDs, sometimes the camera will completely miss the light, and sometimes the camera will get some of it, but not all of it, leading to a dimmer, but still visible light. The signature sinusoidal pattern becomes a fingerprint of the frequency mismatch, a beat frequency between the camera's shutter refresh rate and the LED refresh rate. I think there might be another effect leading to some of that wavy pattern too, uh, some sort of scanning effect that's not sampling every pixel of the camera simultaneously. Okay, I, I think that's enough of the flickering lights and flashing animations. Uh, hopefully that highlighted the real difficult thing about this problem. Every LED light source that is operated at a frequency will introduce flicker for a camera running at a fast enough frame rate. For higher frequencies, the problem may be only exposed by a slow motion camera or a very high refresh rate camera, but the problem remains. To truly solve this problem for every camera that could ever be used, we'll need to use a constant current driver. Of course, Looking at the other point of view, uh, the PWM circuits that we started with became so popular because they're cheap, effective, and good enough for lower refresh rate camera systems. Summarizing again, the problem that we need to solve today is that Alex's LED light sources are flashing because of aliasing. Off-the-shelf solutions exist, but they're either expensive or might not refresh fast enough to actually solve the problem. And Alex happens to know a guy that knows something about electronics and needs a project idea. So this leads us straight into architecture development. The architecture of a system captures an essential part of the engineering process. It's a high level diagram that shows what needs to be built in order to solve our problem. The power of an architecture diagram comes from its strategic lack of detail. For example, we can simply put down a block that says microcontroller without selecting one or considering what peripherals or processing power is necessary. We can place a block that says LED driver without needing to consider the trade-offs between analog and switch dimming circuits. This diagram is calling out some key features that any LED tape driver will need to solve our problem. It must accept power, DMX commands, and have a base address. Then our microcontroller and LED driver will use that information that it received to control the LED and set it to the appropriate color. It's a simple diagram, which didn't take very long to draw, but it will serve us well to double check our final schematic against this diagram to ensure we implemented all of the necessary features. I think this is an excellent start to our DMX project. 
As usual, we've only just gotten started and we have a lot left to do. We'll need to develop an LED driver, a DMX transceiver, consider a lot of nasty parasitic elements of real electrical systems for this to be successful. Hopefully we can deliver a flicker-free LED experience for our friend. Coming up next, we'll be digging into the DMX protocol and discussing some key design considerations like ground loops and transient suppression. I'm really excited for the next step of this project. As always, I'd like to give a special thank you to our channel members on Patreon and YouTube. I really appreciate the extra step you've taken to support us directly. Thank you. I'd also like to thank you all for your support through viewership, comments, sharing what we do with others, those who choose to watch ads, and those who are subscribed. It has been awesome and humbling to watch this EE for Everyone community grow, and that just can't happen without you. Most of all, I hope that you learned something great today, and I hope to see you again soon. So thanks for watching EE for Everyone, and thank you for staying till the end. Bye.